Ladies and gentlemen, it is part two of Day 9 Daily number 387. Not only where we learn to be a better gamer, but we learn why Xenio is a better player than all of us. Cool. What we did in part one is we uh, talked a little bit about our overarching goal in a Zerg vs. Zerg. In every matchup, in any game, you should be able to state, this is my goal. And it should be pretty simple. And after you have established your overall game plan, then we do mini goals. And the mini goal that we talked about at the start of the game is, how do we get up an expansion and keep ourselves alive? We examined how Xenio saw the early expand from his opponent and said, I'm going to put a little pressure on while I'm getting drones and banelings for economy and defense. Cool! And now he has himself a defended, uh, nice, happy two base. Cool. Now it's time for another mini goal. What is Xenio going to have to go for in this particular Zerg vs. Zerg? I waited until part two to bring this up because this is, I think, what really excites me most about Xenio as a player is that during a time when everyone was like, it's a roach is an infested, ugh, ugh. Xenio comes along and starts winning really consistently with a lot of infestors. And not just for fungals, but with uh, the infested Terran eggs in particular. So we're going to see a very cool transition to getting uh, the Infestors up, doing some good stuff with that. And then we're going to see a cool Judgment call um, in the mid-game where Xenio can get up a third base pretty fast. Faster than I would usually expect someone to be able to. And then he's going to get a hell of a lot of Infestors and start working towards that big Roach Infestor control of the right side of the map. So you heard me say at the start, here is the thing that I think is the big key. Gas is what lets you do things in this matchup. It's what lets you do things in all matchups, right? It is the defining resource of StarCraft II. Um, rarely ever do you say things like, yeah, I'm just going to out-mineral him to death. There are some circumstances where that ends up arising. Um, but in general, you're trying to get your gas up. This will allow you the flexibility to say, do I want more upgrades? Do I want more infestors? Do I want to get spire? If you are just sticking to like two gas as you're getting your layer, and you're just mining a lot of minerals, you're essentially siloed into a pretty limited set of things. Even, hell, even if you do get these extra um, extractors up, you can still go roach and just get the appropriate upgrades much, much, much faster. So, um, we see our good buddy, um, Xenio, just trying to do some pokes and prods with his Zerglings and Banelings. Notice how incredibly safe this is. Moving out with three Banelings and more than, I'd probably say, two or three Zerglings. This is, like, almost always safe to do if he has Zerglings. I'm talking a lot about strategy, but as a tactic, I want you just to think about these small numbers. Because you can do this a lot. Don't get stuck in defense mode. Derp, gotta leave my banelings back. Can't only... or I can only defend. If you have three banelings out, what can your opponent do? Well, he can send one zergling after one of the banelings. Well, I already have three zerglings, so I just kill that off. Well, what if he sends two after this baneling? Well, I still have three and kill it off. What happens if he sends three after this Baneling? Then I just detonate the Baneling and kill him off. This is a very safe push to do, provided he has largely Zerglings. So I just, you know, for any of you looking for ways to be a little bit more aggressive, just, you know, do that. Three and three. Super easy. I don't really go four and four because something, I don't know about you, but something just upsets me about having a control group with an odd number of Zerglings. Ugh. Ugh, 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 I hate that. Oh God, because then I envision like half a food just hanging out in the supply cap, and it just doesn't, I just, I just like kill off a zergling. I'm just not, I just can't cope with it. So a nice little push, and these are uh, often good ways to help respond to a player who is being a little bit passive. Because again, I just, <laughs> to throw out the, the body motions, a lot of people will say, oh, he's going to attack. And then they defend. What I want you to get in the habit of doing in Zerg vs. Zerg is to do one of these things, right? Where you're like, well, I'm going to build these units to defend. And if you don't attack, I'm going to attack you with them. Do that lots in Zerg vs. Zerg. Ooh, I needed to build up a bunch of roaches to defend against his attack. 
He didn't attack? Is he making drones? I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. That is the way Zerg Berserk works and why it feels fragile. And we're seeing Xenio do it on a small scale with those Zergling Banelings. Still an essential scale. He needs to come in here and kill off drones. Or attempt to kill off drones if his opponent is getting away with that. So great, we see the usual sorts of timings po um, popping out of our friend Xenio. He's making a lot of drones. Why is he making a lot of drones? That push helped a lot. These overlords that are spotting and seeing nothing help a lot. And so now, this ends up occurring that honestly just tickles my fancy, that makes me feel delighted. Xenio's actually trying to gear up to go expand. This is great. He poked in, saw that there were really not that many units. That's another way of saying, I guess he's building about as many drones as I'm building. Nice. Cool. If he went up there and saw a bunch of units, probably don't want to do this. Probably want to begin the roach production right away. And likewise, if we're perceiving our opponent to be low on units, let me just get that infestation pit up. It's going to be quite cool. And we're just doing our usual same logic. He can only really be threatening us with Zerglings, so we just kind of have Banelings peppering our landscape. And again, one of the most important aspects of all this is to just be rechecking this part a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. We have gas, we have the flexibility to continually re-examine uh, things with gas, overseers, pathogen glands. Everyone's getting the usual types of upgrades, small pushes with Zerglings. And again, we built these Zerglings for defense, and when attacks stopped coming, we get ready to go be offensive. Good stuff, right? Good, easy stuff. Alright, we're poking into our opponent's base. We see him, oh yeesh, building up an extra hatchery. I mean, look at far, how far ahead our opponent is, 93 to 63. I mean, part of that is because he has 12 food and roaches, but he's 12 drones ahead. Luch, yuck, 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 yuck. This attack almost killed off this expansion. I generally try to avoid doing plays like that, the sort of suicide to kill it off, unless it's, like, really obvious that I can kill it off. Because the worst is when this happens, where you commit a ton to it, and it just doesn't pan out. Still using huge numbers of Banelings for the good old defense. Of course, do do that. But one thing that I love that I think is a key uh, decision change point between these two players is at this point we see next Naya starting to really mass up those roaches. Xenio's just going to go absolutely a bonkers. I'm trying to be PG-13. He's going to go absolutely insane with the infestors. He's going to make a lot of infestors. Zerglings do end up springing into action, but again, if we make Zerglings for defense and we don't see anything, why do we not see anything? Center Overlord. Just counterattack. Are you starting to get the sense that you should really, honestly, have a ton, ton, ton of viewing on the middle of the map? Like, super, super, super crazy important. Zerglings, I don't want to say expendable, but our focus right now is the Roach and Fester mixture. Get those geysers up early. And when you get wins like that, you can give yourself a little hearty hooray. Notice that we do have a spore crawler up. We don't want any sort of obnoxious burrow plays to really ruin our day. Provides a little bit of an anchor should he begin to try to be aggressive with something like... Um, something like mutilisks. But again, notice how... At this point in time, our opponent has built up a huge number of roaches... But we, we got all our infestors up earlier, and this is what really excited me a lot. There's some subtle things that are going on here that might be invisible to the human eye, but uh, fortunately, because I am a, because I'm a Muppet, an omnipotent Muppet, I'm, I provide you this information. Notice that, ooh, with a little bit of... Where, where the minerals go? Well, we got ourselves two extra queens, all right? So we can actually manage these extra hatcheries. We have m massive vomiting going on everywhere. We have a little bit more defensive structure stuff going on. A little bit more of that. If we actually pop on over to him, he's just established these. Has none at the front. Yeah, actually, it's kind of an empty thing, so that can be a little bit of a threat. Yeah, I mean, he has a spore crawler here, but Zerglings are not going to be stopped from hitting this point. Uh, yeah, this 
hatch, the only reason it would also have injects is if this queen's missing uh, on those, accidentally missing the injects. So in a sense, the two edges we have is a huge number of infestors, and we have a little bit of what I like to call a counter-attack advantage. We're able to do things like spend extra minerals on um, zerglings, on these defenses. And we're spending a little bit of extra, uh, we're spending our gas, not on roaches, but on these infestors. The infestors are going to help defend us. And we can then counterattack a little bit more easily. Our opponent has to always be aware of the counterattacks. We can pin him down super hard. I do think that these extractors needed to go down quite a good bit earlier. But the general perception that I think your average bear player should be aware of is a lot of drones are getting made, and how is he able to get away with this? Well, it's this huge amount of infestors that he's getting early on. At this point in time, the only things that really I guess you'd need to worry about are mutas or drops in the main. But now we're starting to get a good sense of where everything is in the map. Again, thanks to this unbelievably essential central overlord. I partly even feel like in this matchup, if you get infestors and you have map control, you should actually plop down two infested Terrans and just pick off the overlord. Because it provides so much of an assistance. Now, here is something really interesting to note decision-wise. Notice the complete lack of fungals from Xenio. Only one was thrown down at the end. This is one of those battles where it's really fun to be like, Oh! Oh my god! Oh! Screaming! General Screamery! But let's count the fungals together. Counting, counting fungals. I'm also going to open up the unit counting station so we can sort of see the effect of having this massive amount of infester lead. And it might not seem as massive because 7 doesn't seem overwhelmingly bigger than 6. But we got ours a lot earlier so they actually have more energy. Alright, so here comes the puking. Here comes a small little force, an attempted breakthrough. And there's zero fungals. There's one! And... Alright, there was one. There was a fungal growth. 22. We have way freaking more infested Terrans. And the units lost tab, it's pretty even. But we have way, way the hell more. Still a little bit behind, thanks to that drone lead that began at the start of the game. Just a little bit behind. This is actually really cool with the Zergling Harass, how you can do that sort of burrow tactic stuff. But of course, I want to focus on Monsieur Junio. He's just poking in here to try to find if there's a, a hive. Very easy, common thing to do. Just the same way Terran scan to see if the hive's coming up. Overseer it up to see if that's coming up. And now, of course, here is a point where it's so easy to say, well, hell, what the hell do I do? Ugh, ugh. And to get all frowny about that. So what we're going to actually see out of Azenio is he's going to continually pop back and forth here, trying to find a time that he can actually do an attack. He's getting the Groove Spine, Roach, Hydra, and Fester, much better than just a Roach and Fester. In those direct head-to-head -head engagements, that is. So we're not actually that stressed and strained about it. Because if we just fill in our, excuse me, fill in our food and sort of round out our maxed army with a good bit of hydras, we're going to be in just fine shape. So of course, continuing to scout these, and this is one of these moments where, wow, we wound up in a really unbelievably good position from conquering this right half of the map, getting our roach hydra up. And now the last step is to get the Nidus network, because what did what did I say an overall goal that you could have was? Well, to go drops, maybe to lock down on the middle. And now it's time to start Nidus warming here, Nidus warming there, picking off all these expansions. There's one slight issue, which is that our opponent thought of that about 60 seconds earlier than we did. <laughs> but Xenio is, of course, going to play very defensively, play very far back. I just want to briefly contrast what's going on with Xenio for a brief period with what could be going on. Um, Destiny and other players, you'll see mass up on the Infestors and just mass up on the Spine Crawlers and then play the passive game. And that's, I want you to note that this is essentially equivalent to that. We're still doing the passive thing, but we didn't expend all these minerals and time getting up all these Spine Crawlers. Better players like next Naya will just Nidus Worm right on in and 
you don't really have the flexibility to be able to do it. So suddenly, 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 we've gone from having a plan in part one for our early game. Now we had a plan for the middle game, and we kind of got there. We did this smart infester move. We started to gear up to do a little pressure back. I kind of like to see um, drop getting researched at some point here, um, just because when you have that many bases up, um, you can pretty comfortably afford to get it and then just pull four roaches in and start doing little annoying harassment drops. Um, but still, we basically doing the same idea with these Nidus networks. And now it's time for us to make some judgment calls. Now, I want you just to think about what are infestors good at? What are they good at? They're good at really huge engagements because you can fungal huge amounts of things. They're good at making things stop moving. <laughs> in other words, they're good at sort of deferring engagements. So I like this, uh, the idea that Xenio goes for, where he just kind of starts swinging in towards a huge counter. These guys are just going to be planted here. This is like the Zerg force field, just sort of locking stuff down like that. I don't think that Xenio can really very safely engage that. I think a counterattack may have been the most brilliant thing that could have actually been done right now by Xenio. Again, notice the predominance of using infested Terrans over fungals. Xenio will try to drill his way in. This is kind of a hard spot to judge. I actually think that, you know, doing something like leaving two infestors here, a small amount of troops, and then shoving back with everything might actually end up being stronger. Xenio has some of the coolest infestor usage of all time. Yeah, I think that these guys should have come a little bit earlier. I think that definitely would have behooved him quite a bit more, so... Xenio does end up tragically losing his whole freaking base. And notice Xenio's doing the obvious stuff. Build roaches, build roaches, build roaches. Replenish with roaches. Standard, standard, standard. And it looks like the good old trade. Your base for my base. And now Xenio is in kind of a weird spot. One of the most basic ideas to just exploit is anytime you're feeling really behind, make sure you can continually make infestors and that you have all your gas geysers saturated. That's like the big thing that I always try to look for when I wind up rolling in this matchup because the infester is just such an incredibly versatile unit. Yeah, obviously make the roaches, continue to build that sort of stuff up, but do not forget the importance of adding in extra infestors and keeping the gas count up. The second thing you always want to look for when you're starting to suddenly be in one of these crazy situations, make sure you have enough hatches and queens. Because generally what happens is your queen concentration is skewed towards your main. And then you sometimes don't have a queen here or don't have a queen here. And as we can see, Xenio's money is getting high. Like the instant any intensity begins, like right when this Midas network comes in, train your brain to go, oh, I'm probably going to lose my main. Gas, gas, build a queen, build a queen. Now deal with this stuff. Because Xenio is a smidge behind in this situation right now. So now we're going to step away and we're going to come back for part number three. When we come back to part number three, we will then end up seeing how Xenio finishes out this game, some of the cool decisions that he makes. Uh, and of course, we're going to begin by just recapping some of the big concepts in part number two. Mm. See you in three minutes. Guys, like three minutes. Everyone just needs to calm down.